Okay, hey, listen, uh, welcome back. I'm glad you're still subscribing to the series. <laughs> Keep them coming. Now, this is it. Uh, what is, uh, this is the new catechism show. We hope to uh, show you the new catechism. We hope to, to, to share our experience of uh, the faith uh, in the new catechism with you. For this reason, we have uh, gathered together here at the a parish outside of Washington, D.C. St. Ambrose is the name of the parish. Ambrose was the Bishop of Milan. Ah, oh, yes. I would have rather gathered in Milan, but <laughs> you've got to take what you get, right? You know, and uh, St. Augustine, uh, you will recall, listened to St. Ambrose homilies. And, and realize that uh, maybe there was something about the Christian gospel. And uh, so St. Monica, who was pressuring him, got an appointment for him to visit St. Ambrose. St. Augustine was, you know, a tormented young man. You know, nothing on this earth is more boring than a tormented young man. So. <laughs> So he went over, and you know, Ambrose, what the heck, it's been a busy day and everything. So Ambrose said, hey, what do you want? And so Augustine just, oh, angst and such. I mean, he was this, this man who was going to be one of the greatest saints of all times. Just poured himself out. And you know what St. Ambrose did? He fell asleep. St. <laughs> <laughs> Augustine was so alert during his homilies, and yet when Augustine spoke, Ambrose fell asleep. In this parish, it is the people who feel as, fall asleep during the <laughs> homilies of the Ambrose of here, the pastor. You'll get to meet the pastor if you subscribe to these tapes. That's, that's our big, big. Uh, this is a very welcoming community. And that's very important for the new evangelization. And, and this is very hip and welcoming community. You can tell from the magazine stand the uh, little propaganda stuff outside. This, this is the book they have. Hell and its torments. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yep. <laughs> there it is. Detailed uh, description of what happens if you don't come in here. And uh, to uh, accompany us, we have this beautiful audience here. And uh, we, we've met our musician. And, and in these paintings, these wonderful paintings, are real stuff, really, by living artist, uh, Mr. Robert Burgess, who's sitting there. All right, so that's uh, today. The, oh, yes, and every one of these things is brought to you by a word. Not a letter, because we're better than Sesame Street, but a full word. The word uh, today is destiny. The last time we saw how the New Catechism begins with the search for God, the thirst in the human heart, the restlessness, to quote our man St. Augustine, that only rests secure, really, in the life that it experiences and receives in contact with God, life. And we said that the new catechism then moves on to God's response to this. If it is true that human beings search for God, then the church proclaims that God has and does search for human beings too, which is an astounding thing, an astounding thing that breaks through all religious categories and experiences before this. That God, the ineffable, the one of whom nothing can be said, would actually search for the heart of a human being. And uh, so much so that he would enter into this world of human beings. We made a reference to the scripture quote that begins the prologue from John, the Gospel of John. Father, this is eternal life, to know you and the one 
you have said. But I was interested in the idea of this is. If we miss this, we just forget it, okay? Because this is crucial. And it's crucial because it is here that we begin to depart from the modern oppressive intellectual environment that always grasps things in abstraction. This is, this is right here. We have this strange tendency to want to, to fly away from the precise, the concrete, the unique, the unrepeatable. This is eternal life. Eternal life is not a concept, it's not an idea, it is something concrete, it is touched, it is felt, it is seen with all our sense, senses. We must develop a sensibility, that's the word, sensibility, the senses, you know, for the presence of eternal life in our world. The whole story that the Catechism then tells us is the story of this gradual coming to be better, gradual coming to appear of this concreteness. It starts vague, just as we started in the search. The sacred, the holy, the beyond, the transcendent, the utterly unmentionable. The whole history of the Bible is the history of that becoming more and more and more and more concrete. It is therefore, if you wish, a history of a certain exclusion. Because as it concretizes, then it will show that there are other possibilities that are not it. It's very important. The mechanism, the dynamism, the process of the appearance of eternal life is one of a certain exclusion of closing of possibilities as the range becomes narrower and narrower and narrower. Immediately offhand, you have an astounding exclusion and an election, and that is that of the Jews. Salvation comes from the Jews, the Lord said. Historically, that is the path. We desperately will try here and as well as all the time to abstract that. And when we say the Jews, well, that's just a category to indicate that particular people through whom salvation. No, 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 hey, listen. When I talk about Jews, I mean Sidney Bernstein. I don't mean some kind of abstract category. Cannot abstract it. It means those people historically are chosen and the rest are of possibilities are closed. Salvation will not come from anything that does not have its roots in the Jewish experience and the Jewish life. It will not. Now, it is a salvation for all, indeed. It is an election and an exclusion for all. But what is happening is the stage is being set so that you can have the this is as concrete as possible, such that when you encounter the unique this is, then, then you will enter into a situation that will have to be explored, where then the universal begins again. But for the moment, it is a whole history, when you look at it in the New Catechism, 
of this, this, and this. You know, and throughout the history of Israel, what happens? Usually the least likely gets chosen. Like, like to, mm, to drive home the point, you know. Uh, it's like David, for example. It's this, every other kid's tried, and, and then the one that kind of like remains back there, who wasn't even presented to the prophet. That's the one. No other reason given. Choice. The choice. Something is happening here. Something is happening. And, and we must discover its sense. Choice. Election. Concretizing. This is what is happening. This is what is happening is that human persons can only be reached through the concrete. The abstraction, the abstract, only reaches part of you. In your totality, you are engaged and made totally present when there is person to person, concrete to concrete. And this is what is happening. The wisdom of God is building herself a tent, a concrete tangible tent to be amidst the human race so that it can be identified and found concretely, concretely. So the history goes on and suddenly at each moment of further narrowing something happens the narrowing takes place, the narrowing is in itself what happens. That there is a, an intervention, a, a change, sometimes a change in directions, in lineage and everything. So it's here and then it's to go through here and then through there. Always, there is always some kind of event. The Catechism reminds us that Second Vatican Council says that revelation occurs through words and deeds. The words interpret the deeds and the deeds make concrete the words. This is the dynamism as revelation moves, progresses. So it is, it creates a history. A history with a narrowing, it's like a broadening that is going to start forming like an arrow. So suddenly, after enough of these narrowings, you might grasp a direction. So if it's too broad, you can't tell the direction. The event that happens, hey, what's this stuff? Well, after the second, the third, the fourth, you acquire like a kind of sense that something's going on here. Let me see what's going on here. And, and you see that a pointing is taking place. The word in the Bible that describes this best is the word mystery. The mystery. I'll tell you why, why that's a good word. Mystery. What do, the point is, we say mystery and you mean who, the unknown. That which nobody can figure out. Well, that's not so. You take a look at your Bible. The mystery is to be known. The mystery has been revealed, St. Paul says. So what is this mystery stuff? Well, you know, there is one occasion in which we use the word mystery that comes close to the way the Bible means it, and that is a mystery novel by Agatha Christie. You see, in there, the whole purpose of the mystery novel is so that you will know something that you don't know at the beginning. Well, the whole idea of it's well written is that you should be able, the detective always does, to kind of grasp the why, the plan, the logic of, this, of these happenings. That detective, therefore, is coming to know the mystery. The detective will say, you know, will unveil the mystery. And then you will know, ah, now I know why Mrs. so-and-so. Now I know why this phone call to so-and-so. It will all fit. Well, that's practically the same as in the Bible. The mystery is this 
plan of God, this project, this story, all headed in a particular direction, all becoming concretely realized and pointing to one point, to one, this is the key to the mystery. This is the why. This is the mystery. You read that in the New Catechism and, and your Bible with it. Remember that. And that's the process of the transmission of divine revelation, centered, of course, on the appearance of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. This is the mystery. This is eternal life. I am the life, he says. The life, eternal life, is now not sub an abstraction, an idea, but a someone. And if you want to have eternal life, you have an encounter with this someone. Someone very concrete, ultra concrete. The great uh, theologian Balthazar speaks of the concretissimum, the most concrete. See, we resist that. We want to universalize Jesus Christ. But hey, no, it's Jesus of Nazareth. He's the son of Mary. This is eternal life. This one, no other. This one, no other. And from now on, the religious quest and the desire to live must translate itself as a desire to be in the company of this one, to be in the presence, person to person, with this one. You know, I've always impressed in the Gospel of John, you know, these people are hanging around John the Baptist, you know, he was out there, you know, swimming in the Jordan, that kind of thing, and doing little baptisms by the side. <laughs> anyway, oh, that's what I would do it, but I bet you he took it also seriously. Then. So, and, then, and, and finally, that is the one, he says. And upon just saying that, two of his cats get off and start following Jesus. Just the identification, you know. Remember the, the search for eternal life? The, you are so afraid it will go away. I mean, what is happening here? These people have found concrete eternal life. They don't know how to call it that yet. But they know one thing, they want to be where he is. Because if not, back to, the, back to the search. Back to John the Baptist. At least the search had concretized itself to that movement. But now it's been personalized. That is the one. So they want to know where do you stay? Where do you remain? We want to be in your presence. Where can you be present to us? We don't want you to be absent. See, and you know what he says? Come and see. Follow. Follow. It is in the following me. At all times, you must walk with me. Follow. Come, come. You see, what has happened is, they have met, each one of them has seen this young man, and they have said, you know, there, he is my destiny. And destiny is that towards which you walk, which you hope you have, because if you don't, then nothing makes any sense, and you're just a, a casual thing that may or may not exist. But the person has a destiny. And these two said, that is my destiny. It's not given totally. But now the walk has been set. Follow me. As long as they live within his presence. And this is going to mean something concrete. Huh? It's going to mean hauling out, leaving everybody and just walking around so many times without any apparent direction or knowing what the heck's going on. They don't know. You would think the Lord will kind of like help them. But nothing. Nothing is said about just hang in there and see. 
and they stay. They cannot, because if they leave, they will have betrayed their destiny. They say it, you know, when, when it gets tough, the uh, bread of uh, life discourse, remember? Are you leaving me too? They don't say, oh, well, <laughs> no, we understand you, a bunch of stupid people who didn't, you know, we know what you're talking about. They had no more idea what he was talking about than anybody else. But they just said, we can't, to who else shall we go? Can one go against his or her destiny? No. So that is the path of divine revelation. Suddenly the encounter of the one who searches, meeting the one who was coming in that unique, concrete, singular moment after which everything is different. You have touched your destiny, and a newness begins, a new world, new sounds that you will have to learn, walk, stumble, fall, pick up, whatever. But hey, the old is all over. Eventually, that was going to be described as a new birth a new creation, whatever, newness of life, it's all over, the past is gone. And within that context then, you will begin formulating words, grasping what they mean, putting together the discourse, the profession of faith, etc. We're going to explore all that process.